All right, what's up, everyone? Back for another episode of Not Related. I am Luke Smith, and in this episode, as promised and requested, we're going to be talking about democracy, the rule of the NPCs. A couple weeks ago, we did an episode on Joseph Schumpeter's book, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, and we talked about his views on capitalism and socialism, which if you want to check them out, you can see that episode. But in this episode, since we didn't have enough time to talk about his views on democracy, we're going to cover that. And we're also going to cover some other works since Schumpeter has died, well, he died back in 1950. There has been an entire field to arise called public choice economics, or really political science as we know it today, which studies not just the mechanisms of democracy, but all of the innards of it that, uh, in, a, in a more scientific and rigorous way than people did beforehand, not to downplay anyone before, but in a more formalized way. So we're going to talk about some of public choice economics and stuff like this. I also want to focus on one particular book, uh, which I read around, I want to say I read it around 2011, and this is a book by Brian Kaplan called The Myth of the Rational Voter. Now, Brian Kaplan himself is an interesting character. He's written uh, more recently a book critiquing education and things like this. He, he himself, politically speaking, he, he's uh, one of these uh, libertarian econom economists at uh, George Mason. Um, but his political beliefs aren't particularly important for uh, what we're going to be talking about in this episode. Uh, we're more focusing on his specific mechanistic view of democracy. Uh, but his book, I find it very useful. Again, The Myth of the Rational Voter. You might want to check it out. I remember when I first read it, I really liked it. I think I read it in like one sitting. It was around 200 pages. It's not that long, but yeah, I, I really liked it. My view on it has sort of changed, but um, not, not as if I dislike it now. But anyway, um, so in this episode, talking about democracy, I guess we should go ahead and get the awkward things out. And that is, all of us who grow up in a Western or Western-influenced society are born with a positive view of the word democracy. We are told that it is a good thing. Democracy means freedom and smiles and happiness and anti-democracy. Actually, everything that's not democracy, we're taught, is a totalitarian state where the soul of everyone is crushed, etc., etc. Now, in this video, I'm not going to be critiquing democracy. It's not my objective to critique democracy. If you had asked me a couple years ago, I was very much anti-democracy back then. But, uh, you know, as I look at it now, democracy, and this is what I think people might have struggle, under, uh, struggle understanding, democracy, when it comes down to it, is just a political method, a method of choosing policies and leaders, and you can... Uh, assess the goodness or badness of that. Now, I want to separate the democratic ideology from the democratic method. And when I say democratic ideology, I mean the sense in which, you know, we have this uh, egalitarian notion in political science that, or not political science, but in our popular culture where we should have, you know, low, uh, government by the people, by uh, the average Joes or something like this. People should have a say in political affairs. There's a an ideology to this. And I'm not, this episode, I don't think we're going to focus too much on that. Uh, rather, I want to focus on the mechanics of democracy. How does democracy actually work? Who does it benefit? How What what struggles happen in democracy? What are its potential shortcomings uh, in a purely mechanistic way? And that's what a lot of public choice economics is. So I'll just say, again, if you've grown up in Western society and you, you hear someone looking at democracy with a kind of scientific lens or any kind of formal lens, it might seem like heresy. It might seem like something vaguely blasphemous because you have such a, you're ingrained with such a positive view of democracy. But I encourage you to just uh, stay with us and, uh, I guess, put your, put your ego uh, aside and think about the issues as they actually exist. So let's go ahead and start our discourse on democracy at the most basic level. That is, what is the easiest critique of democracy you can possibly make? And it's something that people say all the time. The easiest critique is people are dumb. If democracy is ruled by the people, people are dumb. Therefore, democracy is ruled by dumb people. Now, of course, when I say people, I mean everyone but us, right? I mean, the fundamental conceit of this critique is, of course, oh, I know what I'm talking about, but everyone else out there, they're the, they're the ones who are misinformed, they're the ones who don't bother doing whatever, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. but we'll talk about that later. But I think everyone understands, regardless of any snide remarks I make about people who make those comments, um, people understand that generally when others are assessing political 
topics or beliefs or stances, it's not the case that they go crawling through old books and statistics to rationally, you know, deconstruct their preconceived notions, deconstruct what is indoctrinated in them. They don't do any of this. When people are talking about politics, they are acting at a mostly non-rational level. This is just a part of life. And despite the fact that, you know, it's something that we think of as being something important, People are not fundamentally very well informed on political domain, uh, in the political domain. I mean, you have polls going around every once in a while that ask people in some place, you know, for example, that'll ask Americans, who's the vice president? And a lot of times they'll be totally clueless. But again, this is the most basic level of democratic critique. Now, Schumpeter, of course, notes this kind of stuff famously on page 262, he says, the typical citizen drops down to a lower level of mental performance as soon as he enters a political field. He argues and analyzes in a way which he would readily recognize as infantile within the sphere of his real interests. He becomes primitive again. And that, I think, is something that you see quite often. I mean, a lot of people will have friends who might be intelligent in their daily lives, but then they have some political beliefs that are just... Uh, extremely basic, you know what I mean? This is something very common, or they have extremely reactive or uh, emotionally manipulated political views or something like this. This is something that happens all the time, or a lot of times people are just going with their gut and not really thinking about the long-term consequences of political actions. Now, Schumpeter, this, when Schumpeter says this, it's part of a more general critique of his view of rationality and economics. A couple, couple pages before that quote, he actually uh, talks about the general problem in economics that economists have this tendency to think that people are more rational than they actually are. On page 257, he says, economists learning to observe their facts more closely have begun to dis discover that even in the most ordinary currents of their daily life, their consumers do not quite live up to the idea, uh, ideal that the economic text used to convey. So the idea, one of the problems in classical economics is the idea that not just in a political domain, but in a, an economic domain, people are imagined to be highly rational, but they don't really act this way. And that's one of the initial problems that caused the arisal, arisal, ar arrivement, I'm just going to make up words, uh, the origin of public choice theory. Now, public choice economics is something that comes to bear shortly after the Second World War. You can look at the specifics of what it's on. It's partially on the analysis of democracy, but also uh, institutions, you know, uh, regulatory capture, the interaction between uh, corporations and the government, stuff like this. It, it's a, a field that actually touches on a lot of things, but a lot of it focuses specifically on the mechanisms of democracy. Now, one of the concepts that was fundamental to the field is it typically attributed to Anthony Downs, and that is the idea of rational ignorance. In a lot of ways, this is what Schumpeter is talking about. And of course, this term doesn't exist in Schumpeter's day, but it does shortly after. Now, the idea of rational ignorance, it's almost self-explanatory, but let's explain it anyway. Um, it's the idea that really no one is going to go searching through the Amazon for truth. That is, in real life, we are not just magically informed about things in politics. We have to go looking for them. We have to go read about them. We have to learn. We have to uh, look at the numbers. We have to learn how to analyze statistics so we can make sapient judgments. There's a, a lot of cost that goes into actually learning. And in reality, people are constantly faced with the decision of, is it worth me, is it, is it worth, is it worth it to, for me to go and learn about this issue with all the cost it is worth. Now, in public, it well, let's say in private domains, let's say that I am going to invest a bunch of money, or I'm, I have a bunch of money and I want to invest it in some kind of business. Now, if that's the case, I have a lot of skin in the game because I'm going to be putting my money on some kind of business and I want it to go somewhere. So I'm going to do my research. But in democracy, that is not the case. That is, if I don't know everything about some political policy, and I vote in a bad way, if I vote for someone who is, uh, supports policies that are bad, that is not something that's going to harm me. Because one of the, the ironic facts of democracy is that although we think of it often as being ruled by the people, ruled by you, you get to make the, the decisions. One of the first facts about democracy is that political power is divided in such tiny slivers in the form of votes that each vote is functionally meaningless.
So your vote, whether you're voting for candidate A or candidate B, we can pretend that it's important, but it's really not. Uh, your vote doesn't really matter as a single vote. So when your practical decision in real life is, should I invest all of this time into learning who is the best candidate? Uh, it might come at extreme cost. Or should I just vote for whoever and it doesn't really matter because I'm not going to, you know, if the candidate I vote for is bad and he wins or he loses, my vote doesn't actually really change that. And I'm not going to have to pay for my mistakes as a democratic voter. That's the idea of rational ignorance. Now, it doesn't just apply to democracy, mind you. It also applies to uh, things in the economic domain generally. As, as Schumpeter notes, it's also the case that people get a little stupid sometimes when they're dealing with things in economic life if they're in a position where they're not really paying for their mistakes. That's something that's fun. You know, it, it, there's a point, or even if, even if they are paying for their mistakes, there always comes a point where it's a waste of time to learn more and more. There's a point where there's no reason for you to learn more about some kind of political topic topic is just a waste of time or economic topic or anything else. And that's one of the realities that public choice economics brings to bear. That is, people in democracy, they are not being irrational. They're actually being very rational. But that rationality means them making the conscious, or not necessarily conscious, but the deliberate decision to not be more informed. Because being informed or not informed does not really make a big difference in their life. That's the takeaway from this. Now, at this point, you might just be like, okay, well, democracy, BTFO, how will it ever recover? And there's a sense in which that is the case. That is, rational ignorance is something that is always going to be there no matter what. It's an inherent property of information existing in the world and it taking a cost for us to learn about it. We have a set amount of time. We're never going to get more time in our day to research these issues. Now you can think of uh, sort of band-aid solutions to this. I mean, people will, in America, we often have civics classes or something like this, and the in attempt there is to inform people about political affairs, but that also can be a little problematic in that what if we incidentally tell them something that's actually bad? What if we imply that a particular policy that is actually really terrible is actually really good and they believe it? Well, that still, we still have the problem of rational ignorance. In fact, it's even worse because in order to overcome that programming they have, they have to be even more assertive. They have to put more time into overcoming rational ignorance. So there's a kind of catch-22 when dealing with this. So superficial solutions, uh, they're a little problematic. Now, there is an argument out there that is actually common among many uh, public choice economists and people in the public, and that is rational ignorance doesn't actually matter. Now this is going to be the view that Brian Kaplan in his book The Myth of the Rational Voter is going to dispute, but let's go ahead and introduce this idea. Now there's a book back in, actually Kaplan sort of wrote his book in a response to a particular book written by a New Yorker journalist called, what was it, Wisdom of the Crowds, Wisdom of the Crowds. So this book uh, illustrates an idea that's sort of common in a lot of people when talking in, in an attempt to revitalize democracy in its idealistic form. And that is, it's the idea that people might be rationally ignorant, but in a democracy, it actually doesn't matter. And what's the idea behind this? Now, the idea behind the wisdom of the crowds, or sometimes Kaplan refers to it as the miracle of aggregation, is that sometimes you can take 90% ignorant votes and 10% informed votes and actually get extremely good policy that would be the same as if you had 100% informed votes. How does that happen? Now, the original parable, which actually isn't a parable, it actually happened, comes from the life of Francis Galton. Now, Galton, he was, uh, it's hard to describe him with one noun. He did everything. We'll just say that. He was a, a, a renaissance man. He was a scientist, actually a Parascientist too. He, he went into even some more occulty things. He's an interesting fellow. But one anecdote from his life is that one day he was out and about walking around town and he stumbled by a butcher. And a butcher had this uh, ox and he asked the crowd, okay, how, how much do you think this ox weighs? And he took an answer from everyone in the crowd. Now, everyone in the crowd might have, uh, you know, including children, senile people, people who didn't know anything about farm animals, would give different answers, sometimes wildly different, sometimes, oh, it weighs five pounds, or, you know, weighs a thousand pounds, or something like this. Widely variant answers. 
But one of the things that Galton noticed is when the butcher took all of the uh, entries and summed them up, averaged them, the average of them was actually pretty much exactly what the ox actually weighed. So the idea here is, okay, well somehow, um, despite the fact that most people have no clue about oxes or how much they weigh, they've never had to do with deal with any of that, um, there's a sense in which everyone got it right altogether. Now, how does that happen? Is that some kind of uh, miracle? Uh, it is if you call it the miracle of aggregation, but it actually happens for a very particular reason. And that is, when you think of it this way, if you don't know how much an ox is going to weigh, or if you have no idea, you're going to give a wild guess. And your wild guess might be on the low side, it might be on the high side. And let's say you make a guess on the low side. Let's say you underestimate the ox's weight. Someone else in the crowd probably is going to overestimate the ox's weight by about the same amount. And in fact, if you take the whole crowd, even if 95% of the people have no clue and they're just guessing random numbers, um, even if the other 5%, all, all you need is the other 5% or so to know about what this ox's real weight is, and they can, their answers become the median of all this. So all the variance that people have, it sort of cancels, it's sort of like the law of large number, numbers. All the statistical noise cancels out, and you actually have a very good estimate at the end, and that's something that's very nice. Um, now this has been used in many other circumstances. I remember one common example people talk about is the, I think the Navy, the US Navy, used to use a technique where you know they were looking for a, a ship at the bottom of the ocean or something like this, or there's some, some kind of lost cargo. And they actually just asked a whole bunch of people uh, in the Navy, where do you think this is? And you know they put their estimates, uh, plotted them on a map, averaged them up, and strangely enough, it actually ended up being pretty much exactly where the lost luggage was. So this is the idea of the miracle of aggregation or the idea of the wisdom of the crowds is that while the crowds might be brainlets individually, if you put them all together, they suddenly become big brained or really the biggest brain people become the ones who define what the crowd is actually going to do. So now this is going to be the idea that Kaplan's book is a critique of. But before I talk about the specifics, I want to give sort of a personal introduction to when I read this book, which again was back in 2011, and this was during the Occupy Wall Street protests. You might remember that. It was probably before you Zoomers times, but uh, the Occupy Wall Street protests, again, they happened pretty much in a lot of major cities. I, at the time, was in Atlanta. I was an undergraduate at Georgia Southern University. And I walked by the protests pretty much every day. Um, and sometimes I had my smug anime girl face on, but I actually had a lot of friends who were, uh, not a lot, but you know, a couple who were involved in this protest. Now, the ideology of the Occupy Wall Street people, or the ideas in the air, were such of radical democracy. I mean, it was your typical sort of um, you know, boilerplate, anti-corporate, anti-bailout kind of stuff. Um, but also there was a lot of raw democracy. That is, you had these groups of people who would stand all together and then they would vote in one voice. I mean, they all agree on everything, so it wouldn't really be real voting. Um, but, you know, they'd have this sort of mass m management of their movement and stuff like this. And there was a lot of ideology of democracy that was sort of been, being talked about. And again, I had a couple friends who were in my economics department at the time who had been exposed to a lot of the miracle of aggregation, this kind of wisdom of the crowds mindset, where even if they disagree, well, I mean, in defense of Occupy Wall Street or any other protest, it's just inevitable that 95% of the people in it are going to be total brainlets. But the other 5% would have this view of the miracle of aggregation. That is, a lot of the people in the movement might not know what's going on, but it would be great to have democracy not just for the movement, but direct democracy for everything because of this miracle of aggregation, because of the fact that, yes, well, people sometimes make mistakes, they are not necessarily well informed, but it's really the smart people, the people who are have a systematic bias to the truth that end up ruling democracy. All of the errors sort of cancel each other out. So a lot of my friends had this view at the time. This is something that a lot of people were talking about, including myself. And I ended up reading Kaplan's book. I don't remember how I ran across it. But I think I said earlier, I read it nearly in one sitting. I, I really enjoyed it at the time. 
Uh, I had probably agreed more on Kaplan's politics back then than I do now. I reread it this week, and at the time I thought it was like just full of hot takes. Now I'm re- I reread it last week, and I was like, ah, it's not as not as hot as I thought before. But I still think it's very good of a book in terms of public choice. But it also illustrates uh, Kaplan's key concept of not just rational ignorance, but rational irrationality. Now, what is rational irrationality, okay? So it's an extension of this idea of rational ignorance that actually critiques the idea of the miracle of aggregation. So specifically, just as a reminder, right? So in any kind of democratic system, you have no real control over what happens in politics. You have one vote, and the chance of that vote actually making a difference in election is about the chance of you getting struck by uh, by lightning on the way to the polls. That is basically the chance of you ever affecting an election. So you'll have no skin in the game to actually inform yourself on any particular policy. Now, the thing that Kaplan notes very crucially, and this is not just in his book, he actually put out a paper in, I think, 2001, where he came out with this concept originally. But what Kaplan notes is that the miracle of aggregation and the wisdom of the crowds, that is reliant on the idea that the errors always cancel out, or the errors are not systematically biased. Now what Kaplan's view is, and he has a lot of very interesting statistics behind this, is that people's political errors, or the things that they misunderstand, it's not that, to use the example of the ox, it's not that half the people are underestimating the weight, and half the people are overestimating, uh, overestimating the weight. It's not, like the, it's not like the ox estimation. That is, in politics, the reality is, even if there is one good policy, there is also something that people want to be true, or there is something that they feel is true, or there, so, there's something that they are sort of brainwashed into thinking is true, etc., etc. Their errors are not just random. That is, if you make a political error, it's not that you are just making a guess in the same way you would guess about the weight of an ox. You are usually following some kind of bias you already have, and those biases are systematic. Now, how Kaplan teases apart these systematic biases he alleges people have is by looking at the Survey of Americans and Economists on the Economy, the SAEE. Now, the SAEE is exactly what it sounds like. It is a comparison of the political beliefs and dispositions of the public and economists. And Kaplan's idea, he actually compares three different categories. One is the views of the general public on the, eco- on the economy. One is the views of PhD economists. And one, since of course PhD economists and average people don't have the same political party orientation, they don't have the same socioeconomic status. In order to tease out those variables, he creates a statistical category called he calls the enlightened public. And what that means is if you had the social class and the political orientation of the general public, but with the beliefs or the dispositions at that level for a PhD economist. So you might, of course, object. I'll go ahead and say uh, you might object to the fact that he is using as a indicator of informed decisions or informed views on policies, PhD economists, because I'm not a big fan of economics. A lot of people aren't. And there are many reasons to think that there might be systematic biases in the in the way that economists think or believe. Now, despite that, that I don't think really gets in the way of Kaplan's point. In fact, I don't really think he even uh, agrees with everything that economists believe as opposed to the public. But I'll just say that the idea, the rebuttal of the idea that there is no systematic bias, the idea that there is a miracle of aggregation, is still just as troubled by the fact that there is a systematic bias in the public and in, or in some other group, that is. So to make Kaplan's point extremely clear, the idea is, uh, let's take one example. So one bias he gives is the make-work bias, that's what he calls it. And the idea of the make-work bias is that average people, as opposed to economists, have a tendency to look at economic, the economic domain as if the objective is to provide labor. That is, provide jobs, provide, you know, people have to be out there doing things. So when it comes to something like technology gradually replacing workers, 
average people are like, no, we, we have to keep it so that technology doesn't replace us. We have to be in our traditional jobs or something like that. Now, PhD economists tend to not really buy that argument. They have the general idea that, well, yes, um, technology is going to replace jobs. It's going to put people out of work. But in the long term, that's actually going to be something good because we're going to get things produced more efficiently with machinery. That money is still going to be there. There just is going to be a movement from one job to the other. Okay, so that, for example, is one of the biases that Kaplan illustrates. Now, again, the point, you, you, whether you believe the particular arguments, the political arguments, I think is not necessarily the point. The point is there is a systematic, it is not the case that either PhD economists because they're dumb or the public because they're dumb is making just random decisions. People have systematically different political beliefs based on you know their disposition. disposition. So if we take back the um, the allegory, the parable of the ox, it's not the case that people who are less informed are just making random guesses and half of them are overestimates, half of them are underestimates. People are making systematic decisions. They, have, they vary systematically from other groups. It's not random. Now another question that Kaplan tries to answer in some sense is where do these biases come from? So people have systematically flawed beliefs, whether they're average people or anything else. So where do these beliefs actually come from? And he gives a couple options, and I think there are others aside from this. One, for example, an obvious one is self-serving bias. That is, people have a tendency, in the example of mechanization of a factory, obviously someone who works in a factory and is liable to be replaced by a machine is not going to like that machine taking his job. Uh, that even if you go to him with all the typical economic arguments about, oh, well, this is going to be efficient, you know, in 40 years, once the global market equilibriumizes, it, you're actually going to be getting a whole lot more money. This is much better for economic efficiency. Obviously, people are not going to buy this kind of argument, even if they buy it at a logical level. There's a sense in which people are going to be rationally self-serving. They do not want this to happen. In the same way that, you know, people are biased against, you know, someone like Kaplan, right? So Kaplan... Um, actually he's noted for occasionally being bully cited for his uh, effectively open borders views on immigration. And he makes the same point there. It's like, oh, well, you know, later on, uh, economists don't care about immigration because uh, later on it's all going to be Ricardian uh, comparative advantage. It's going to be a more efficient market, going to produce things more effectively. And of course, people who are affected by immigration or something else, obviously, are not going to like that. Even if you come up in their face with an argument about how it is more efficient later on or how it looks, how pretty it looks on some kind of economic diagram, people are going to be self-serving and self-interested in their political beliefs. So that is one fundamental distinction between your average person, that's a bias that they have, and the PhD economist. Now, of course, you can, again, I'm not necessarily giving any credence to Kaplan's particular interpretation. You could just as easily say that an economist, in a way, is, is biased against the short term. That is, if there's uh, there are a lot of equations that economists have, and there are a lot of variables that are not part of that equation. So don't take my, my saying this as an endorsement of his general political beliefs, but we'll just say that. Uh, but aside from that, the general idea still still stands. That is, people have systematically different beliefs and systematically different from what ra reason dictates in his view. Now, you can, of course, imagine other biases that might push people's political beliefs in a systematically different way as well. You know, as we sort of alluded to earlier, uh, I mean, especially nowadays, there is a kind of social bias that people have. That is, there are particular political beliefs which are high class, which you can say anywhere, which you get claps for, um, and there are some political beliefs which you can be depersoned for and fired for and stuff like this. So in any society, you know, that has these kind of social incentives for p particular political beliefs, uh, your given assumption should really be that there's a sense in which uh, the, a democracy is going to be biased in the way that those biases nudge them towards. That is, if you get credit for having a particular political belief, if you get uh, money or fame or something like this for having a particular political belief, you are more likely to believe in it. Whereas if you are fired or shamed or lied about for some kind of political belief, you're going to be less likely to believe it. And that, again, 
puts us in a dangerous position where there might be some ideas that need particular questioning that are totally unquestionable because to nudge society in a way that is less harmful to itself would require enormous personal risk in political affairs. Now, anyway, so I think we're about at 30 minutes or so, so I'm going to take a break. I'm going to have a little lunch, and then I'm going to come back, read some donations, emails, comments from the last episode on Albion Seed, and uh, yeah, I'll see you guys uh, then. All right, folks, we're back. That was quick, wasn't it? Um, so let's go ahead and read some donations, emails, and then we'll talk more about democracy and politics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So donations. First off, news. Uh, I did recently get, uh, you can donate via Bitcoin now. If you go to my website, you can click on, I think there's a donate or Bitcoin thing. I, I did it a week or so ago, so I forget what I named it, but you'll see it. It's on the front page. Um, I actually got my first Bitcoin donation from Miguel. He says, would like to thank you for your work on YouTube and the podcast. Also compliment you on your eloquence and audacity to talk about advanced topics with such ease. Thank you, the one-day sovereign Portuguese Miguel. Thank you, Miguel, for my first Bitcoin donation. So eventually that's going to be worth millions of dollars, that uh, $15 worth of Bitcoin. But um, So in addition, uh, I might as well read the new Patreon people. Uh, Aurum Core joined $10 a month. Michael K joined $5 a month. Stefan G, $3 a month. Thank you, guys. Um, let's go ahead and look into emails. So a couple general emails. Uh, first off, I've been getting a lot of questions about what kind of podcasts uh, I recommend people listen to that are similar to mine. I honestly don't think there are any similar to mine. I don't know. I'm not really a big fan of podcasts. I'm doing mine as really more for myself. I mean, it's not like I'm going to listen to my own podcast anyway, but... Um, uh, I mean, it's really just an exercise just for me to get some of the stuff I've read over the years out of out of my head and into somewhere to make it useful for someone besides me. But um, yeah, I, d I don't know if there are any podcasts of similar topics to mine, mainly because mine is on different topics every time. But anyway, some other some other comments. Um, I'll, I'll sum up. I got a lot of questions on Albion Seed that are again Albion Seed for British folkways in. America, I think that's the subtitle, whatever. You can check out that episode. Again, it's on four different British ethnic groups that defined American socio-political culture, how they interacted over this period. Um, I got a lot of questions on that, some general ones. Uh, let's see. Um, one question that was common is, where do people in the West fit in? Uh, so, for example, where do the Mormons fit in? People of Utah and stuff like that. And I think, um, well, to give... Give Fisher's general view again is he has a primarily assimilationist view of most immigration into the United States, and I think when it comes to westward movement, a lot of the cultures, Mormons being ex an example, might be thought of as a kind of hybrid of a lot of the different uh, groups. But he's not very specific. You can check the book out. You can get the PDF and search for it. I searched myself. There are only a couple times he even mentions Utah Mormons stuff like this or a lot of the other West Coast cultures. And the other thing you have to remember is a lot of the people moving out here, I mean, the West, I, the, the so-called flyover states, they're not very densely populated anyway. So a lot of these people are just particular families that moved out, and, you know, they have a, a culture, but I don't know if it uh, distinctly fits into one of the four categories or if they're more uh, a general, uh, they take traits from the different ones. Um, other questions. So I got some questions um, about what about the urban and rural divide, you know, people in the United States. So a lot of people would say stuff like, um, oh, well, that's an interesting theory, the four ethnic groups in American history. But what about just uh, doing it in terms of urban and rural or some kind of class distinction? Maybe it's just the, the so-called Puritans in the book are really just more like upper class people. And the borderers are planters. Well, less the planters in history, but, you know, the borderers tend to be lower class people. Um, I think that works for some things, but to give the examples that I gave, particularly of contemporary Amer American politics, look, for example, again, at the electoral shift in the tw 2016 election. Okay, So a lot of people who are plugged into like Nate Silver and all of this stuff, they have the idea that there is a change in educated and non-educated white voters and there's an urban-rural divide. And the reason they think that is because those are the statistical categories that people like Nate Silver have easy access to. 
But if you look at it, if you look at the interface between those categories and geography, you actually see there's a huge geographic uh, switch in the 2016 election, specifically, you know, in the Northeast and in Michigan, Wisconsin, all of these former Puritan or quasi Quaker uh, places. Um, you have an electoral shift to the Republican Party of something like 30 points. Now, you don't have this in other rural places in North Dakota or something like that. In fact, in a lot of places since, you know, in the South, there's a lot of places where the South actually moved to the left because all of these people were already voting Republicans. So if there's any movement in any particular class to the, uh, the Democratic Party, you're going to see that. So I think, uh, I think urban and rural... Uh, do have something to do with it. I think it's all part of an ensemble, but I think that the ethnic group uh, interpretation has has a lot more weight than uh, looking at other narrowly demographic things. And of course, the difficulty is how do you determine who's a, a borderer or a Puritan or something like that? You have to deal in generalities a lot of the time. Um, but you know, that, those are just things to, to think about. Uh, let's see, anything else about... Uh, oh, okay, so uh, a guy, I don't know how he pronounces this name, but Nucleus Thiet, uh he brought up, uh, in reference to Albion C, he brought up uh, Mitchell Heisman's suicide note. I don't know if you've ever heard of this guy, Mitchell Heisman. He's this guy, I think he went and shot himself on Harvard, like in front of some kind of group of students or something, and he left like a 2,000-page manifesto suicide note that was uh, a lot of it had to do with like ethnic distinctions between the native anglo-saxons and the normans in britain and how history was a conflict between them and stuff like that so i, I don't know if that has much to do with albion seat i mean it's similar they have you know in that they deal with a lot of history in terms of ethnic distinctions um but yeah I ha i've never read his 2000 page suicide note i haven't i I forget when I first ran across that. I thought it was crazy at the time, but I was like, "Oh man, I'm not I'm not red pilled enough for this." Maybe I'll look back at it. I don't, but maybe it's crazy. Who knows? Uh, let's see. Another question here. I got a couple of this uh, nature. Uh, this was on the the note that the Quakers used "thou" to mean the singular pronoun and "you" as the plural pronoun when addressing multiple people. Um, and this, of course, was common in older English all the time. I got a couple people. This guy, uh, Mega Moore, says he is Lithuanian and asks, Lithuanian has words that are basically exactly the same, and they, like earlier English, the plural form is often used as a polite form as this, of the singular. And he's wondering if they are coincidentally related to the English words, since they are Indo-European languages. And, of course, that is, in fact, exactly the case. They are demonstrably related through a set of... A chain of sound laws. I'm sure you could look it up yourself. But yeah, most of the pronouns of Europe are going to come from the same origin. And of course, you know, the other Indo-European languages of North India and Iran or wherever, they are related. And uh, yeah, and there is a tendency, this is actually not just in Indo-European languages, but other languages to gradually use the plural pronoun to mean the singular as a form of politeness. This is actually a common tendency out there. So that's just a little minor note for people who don't know it. All right, that about does it for the feedback for this episode. Again, I couldn't touch on every single comment or email I got just because there are so many, but I hope those I responded to gave a decent enough response to what people were thinking. And again, if you have any questions, you can email me at uh, luke at lukesmith.xyz. You can donate at uh, paypal.me slash lukemsmith. That's M as in monolith. Or you could just go to my website, LukeSmith at XYZ, and it has everything in there, including the donate to Bitcoin, or don donate via Bitcoin, or with Bitcoin, or just donate Bitcoin. You know what I mean. So anyway, let's get back into democracy. Let's get back into what we were talking about earlier. Now, um, I've covered a lot of, of what Kaplan's view is. I think if you want to get more into his particular beliefs, I recommend you read his book, again, The Myth of the Rational Voter. Um, but I want to talk about Schumpeter's take on democracy, and I also want to take... Uh, another take from another writer that who I strongly recommend, and that is James Burnham. Now, Burnham wrote a book a while ago. It's a pretty, pretty big-brained book um, that I want to read from in a bit. Uh, but it's called The Machiavellians, The Defenders of Freedom. It's a, it's a hot take, not just on democracy, but on politics in general. But first, I want to talk about the idea that we sort of left off on, and that's the idea of public will and people having different interests. 
Now, as I said before, if you're a factory worker who is going to be affected by mechanization or immigration or something like this, you are going to have a horse in the race. You are not going to want a particular policy to be implemented, even if, even if you logically concede that down the line there might be some efficiency bonus to everyone, including yourself. Now, aside from that, now Kaplan is mostly dealing with the difference, his view of uh, biases among people is that people are short-sighted. In this case, he thinks of the factory worker as being short-sighted or he's focused too much on himself. That is his bias. But I think one thing important to remember is that there are some times where there are differences in politics that cannot be mediated by logic. And this is something that I think a lot of people have some trouble dealing with. Um, there's a tendency nowadays, you know, people talk about this thing that is called identity politics, right? So identity politics, whenever someone's talking about that, they're talking about it in a bad sense. Identity politics in bad, is bad. But there's some sense in which pretty much all politics in one way or another is a form of identity politics. And it might not be blatant, but there's a lot of sense in which the policies you take are often those that benefit you at a subtle level or at least are not massively antagonistic to you. Now, one, one example I like to use is you know, I live in Georgia right now. I actually grew up in Georgia. I've been moving around, but I grew up in Georgia. And one thing, one political issue in Georgia is that we ha share borders with both Alabama and South Carolina. And those borders are partially mediated by rivers. Now, one thing, one political issue that has been important for all of these states is which states have the rights to manipulate the river. Where can you dump things? Where, where can you take water out? Whose right is it to use the river and stuff like this? Now, in the case of the factory worker who's going to be unemployed, you can take an economic bug man perspective of, well, there are two sides. There's the pro-mechanization and anti-mechanization side. But really, the pro-mechanization side, they are in the long term more efficient. But in a lot of political affairs, it is really just a zero-sum game. So in, if Georgia and Alabama have a dispute over uh, how to use the river that partially separates the states, they will, there's not, there's not like a rational side and an irrational side. One party wants to be able to dump here. One party wants be, to be able to uh, take water out lower on the river or something like this. This is something that happens all the time. So a lot of people have the idea when they're dealing with politics that there are rational people and there are irrational people. And, you know, oh, the, the problem is we need to make people more rational and then we could all agree on the same things. But the reality is in a lot of places, the difference, the problem is there's no concrete thing called public will. People have different opinions. Those people might belong to different social, political, racial economic groups that have different interests, but it's not necessarily the case that all of society has those same interests. Now, Schumpeter puts it, this is on page uh, 251, he says, There's, there is, first, no such thing as a uniquely determined common good that all people could agree on or be made to agree on by the force of rational argument. One of the things you need to get used to in politics is that What's good for one person might not be good for another, and it's not necessarily the case that there is some rational way, even if we could convince people, even if we could convince them or, or make them rationally rational or rationally knowledgeable instead of rationally ignorant, even if we could transcend those informational boundaries, there's still a sense in which sometimes what's good for you is just good for you, and what's good for someone else is just good for someone else. Uh, Schumpeter also says, uh, this is a couple pages later, he says, through a common, though a common will or public opinion of some sort may still be said to emerge from the infinitely complex and individual group-wise situations, volitions, influences, actions, and reactions of the democratic process, the results lack not only rational unity, but also rational sanction. Now, his point here is that in democratic society, what often happens is the different interests in society, again, class interests, racial interests, uh, other economic interests, things like this, or even geographic in interests in the sense of one state wanting a river and another state wanting a river, they can compete in a lot of ways. And what policies they end up making together in the federal legislature or somewhere else aren't necessarily going to be something I even either of them really want. I mean, we live in a society where often you'll have 
a political party which starts some kind of government program and the other par- other party doesn't want to support it or wants to undermine it or get rid of it. And so we end up in a position where it, it's sort of, you know, a prisoner's dilemma in the sense that we have a lot of things in political affairs that are based on that are flawed because there is a difference in opinion between the or incentives or interests between the two different groups. Now, this is not so much, I mean, this is not something that's going to go away. There is just a sense in which no matter how you organize your society, there's no such thing as just everyone having the same interest, even if it's just you and another guy who uh, make decisions, quote unquote, democratically. There's no way for you to perfectly have perfectly aligned interests. It's not just that we're a multi-ethnic society, so we have different racial interests. We also have different economic interests between different classes. We also have different uh, geographic interests, etc., etc., etc. Now, this is often something that's not too difficult for people to understand, but it does take an extra level of uh, introspection, I guess, to make the next leap. And the, the next leap is, while other people, we can look at other people in politics, we can look at our political opponents, and we can see, ah, well, they're being irrational. Uh, you know, they're using they're they're using logic, but they're using logic as just kind of formal wear. They're they are really just doing what they already think is true at a pre-rational level. And we, as their political enemies, we can see through that. We can see every logical node in their decision making might be flawed or based on bad assumptions or wishful thinking. And it, you know, often time at times it's coded in you know cool, calm allegedly dispassionate rhetoric, but when we see political enemies advocating for something that is in their interest, they might adopt some kind of ideology to propose it, but we can usually see through that, right? And in the same way, they can see through our our pretenses. That is, you might take some kind of deep uh, ideological stance that has all these principles and stuff like that, but at the core, you're just defending yourself from assault or political loss or something like that. That's something that I think takes a little bit of of uh, it, you have to be a little self-deprecating or self-aware to be able to make that realization. Now, this is why I bring up the book by James Burnham because now I don't, I'm not going to talk about the entirety of this book. I'm going to talk about just about the first section, which I think has the powerful kernel of truth in it. And what the first section? The first section is called uh, I think it's Dante Politics as a Wish or something like that. It might be a word off, but. The idea behind it is relatively simple. He talks about Dante, and this, of course, is the Dante of the Divine Comedy, you know, the Inferno and all this stuff. So Dante wrote a book called De Monarchia, the Latin title that means on monarchy or on the empire or something like this. It depends on how you want to translate it. Um, But Dante wrote this treatise, and it's on politics. It's on a sort of I don't want to say spiritual, but it's on his general metaphysical political views. And what it amounts to, it argues in effect that there must be a, in a sense, global empire, uh, one imperial unity uniting the entire world. And there are particular moral reasons for this. One of the most important ones is the crucifixion of Jesus. So in his idea, the Roman Empire, Jesus had to come during the Roman Empire where there was a kind of global world government, in a sense, uniting all the different peoples, at least the Mediterranean, at least the world that you know he's paying attention to. Um, there had to be a global government here because in order for Jesus to be condemned to death, he had to be condemned to death by a jurisdiction that was global in scale. For him to be, you know, convicted, sentenced to death, to rise again, that conviction had to be universal. Okay, that jurisdiction that he was convicted in had to be universal. That's the the sort of background to his view. And he has other views as well that this kind of global monarchy that uh, is going to be one where since there is a political unity, there are no states to fight among each other and the monarchy mediates, uh, effectively causes a kind of Pax Romana and in his view, it was the Holy Roman Empire that was the successor to the Roman Empire, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He had very particular views on this. And he, again, he goes through a metaphysical, a spiritual, a religious rationalization, or I don't want to say rationalization yet, but a, a, a very spiritual worldview that communicates a kind of political context or a, a political goal. And that political goal is one Pax Romana, one universal empire mediated by 
you know, a secular state as opposed to a divine state, because it's his view that a secular state had to be the one to convict Jesus, etc. Now, Burnham, of course, goes through all of this ideology of Dante. He explains de monarchia. He explains the justification for it, all the arguments. And he ends up saying that nowadays we look at this and it's a ridiculous document, right? It doesn't mean, I mean, all of this stuff, first off, most people don't believe in this kind of stuff, the the universal jurisdiction. Of course, lots of people don't believe in Jesus or anything like that. They're not religious at all. It's all a bunch of hokey. So in terms, in political terms, this, of course, is utterly worthless. But what Burnham notes is that in reality, Dante was not really putting forth a metaphysical worldview that is supposed to stand alone. He's putting forth really a practical rationalization of his real world politics. Now, Burnham proposes that in political affairs, there are two different meanings to everything. There is the real meaning of things, and that is, you know, why do you actually support something? Why do you actually support a policy? And there's a formal meaning to things, and that is, that means, well, uh, this is the, the ethical rationalization for what you believe. So in Burnham's view, what Dante does in De Monarchia is gives a formal rationalization for his worldview, his uh, all of this stuff about the universal jurisdiction and the, uh, the universal peace, all of this stuff, there's some practical stuff in it, but most of the ethical justification is just nonsense. It's formal nonsense. It's meaningless. And what Burnham notes is that if you take this and put it in its actual context, the actual context that it's written in, you really see that Dante was not making some kind of dispassionate ethical and political judgments. He's really making a very specific political argument at his time. Now, to explain what's actually going on, so I'll be specific. During the late Middle Ages, you may have heard of this, but there were two major factions that occasionally butted heads in medieval Europe, and that is the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. Now, the Guelphs were the party of the papacy. They supported the papal states, papal power uh, in Italy and in other places. And the Ghibellines were the party of either the aristocracy or often the Holy Roman Empire. And these different parties, these different uh, uh, allegiances, so to speak, would often clash in a lot of the politics of different countries in Europe constantly. Now, for Dante, Dante grew up as a Guelph, as a pro-papacy advocate. And long story short, we'll just say that he was part of a moderate conciliatory member of uh, one a Guelph or pro-papacy group, which was exiled from his hometown. And when that happened, all of a sudden he finds himself allied with his previous enemies, the Ghibellines. And what ends up happening is that he crafts this political narrative, which is a rationalization of the Holy Roman Empire, the supremacy of secular authority against papacy. He crafts this political document, which happens to support the politics of someone like him who has converted from this papal worldview onto this, I shouldn't even say worldview, into the an allegiance with the papal power to an allegiance with secular power. So Burnham's idea is effectively that, okay, well, it's cute to look at this as if it's some kind of political, like rational, uh, you know, rational political worldview. But in reality, it's him providing a justification for his own particular incentives at the times. He is supporting the, pa the party which is, he's aligned with. And there's not necessarily any deep ethical meaning behind this. This is just how it is. The way that Burnham puts it, this is only page 19, he says, Eternal salvation, the highest development of man's potentials or potentialities, everlasting peace, unity and harmony, the delicate balance of abstract relations between church and state, all these ghosts and myths evaporate, along with the whole structure of theology, metaphysics, allegory, miracle and fable. The entire formal meaning, which has told us nothing and proved nothing, assumes its genuine role of merely expressing and disguising the real meaning. This real meaning is simply an impassioned propagandistic defense of the point of view of a turncoat Bianchi, that's the Guelph faction, or the moderate Guelph faction he was a member of, exiles from Florence, specifically and more generally of the broader Ghibelline point of view, to which the Bianchi capitulated. De Monarchia, we might say, is a Ghibelline party platform. 
Now, Burnham is wise to use a political example of this, which is far in the past. I mean, no one cares about the Guelphs and Ghibellines. I mean, you might say they exist in some sublimated sense nowadays, but they're gone. No one cares. No, no one has any emotional attachment to this. But what it illustrates is something very fundamental, and that is in the real life, a lot of times we look at these things called ideologies, we look at these the, the ideological cloaks that people wear, the justifications, the ethical worldviews that people construct that have values and morals and goods and bads, all of these things. But there's a tendency for people who are making those to make them in their own image, to create them in a way that is very convenient for their particular class or group or whoever they are advocating for. And this is one of the things that I think we have to keep in mind where, when analyzing politics and analyzing democracy in particular. Because a lot of times we think of, we think of democracy, so, well, not most people, frankly, most normies don't really think of democracy as being a battle between ideologies, or if they do, it's, it's at some abstract level. A lot of times people are starting to understand politics as something between, I am for this party, against this other party, and you're a member of that, and we disagree, we are groups, we are fighting each other. But I think there's a tendency of big brain people to sort of deceive themselves in a lot of ways, where they get so engrossed in the logic of their ideology that they forget the fact that oftentimes that what they're rationalizing is often just something that's good for them, or at least convenient, or at least avoiding some terrible terrible bad for them. Now, I'm not saying that all of politics is like this, but I think you have to keep in mind that in any kind of democratic politics, I mean, people, if you're trying to convince people of something, you can't just go into, you can't create a political campaign and say, I want this because it's good for me. What happens in a democracy, what happens in not just a democracy, but even a society like Dante's world, where there are allegiances of individual people that matter, what often happens is there's a kind of self-deception that people put themselves in, where they try and rationalize their worldview, and they try and make that worldview appealing to people who it might not necessarily be the interest of to support. Now, this goes back to what Schumpeter says about the non-existence of public will. There is no such thing as one democratic uh, interest that all people have and share and fight for and stuff like this. There's no such thing as this. People are really different, and even at the realm of logic... People are often not necessarily dealing in good faith, they're dealing in political rationalizations. They are liable to look at things with particular assumptions based on what is politically expedient for them. Now, having thrown away the concept of public will, Schumpeter creates what he calls a new theory of democracy. He contrasts that with what he calls the classical theory, which uh, you could trace back to different people, but it's just sort of a common assumption. Now, what what the difference he makes between the classical theory and his own theory is that in the classical theory, the democracy, the voters, were the active participants of creating a government and policy. They are the ones who, you know, politicians appear, they have different beliefs, and people will pick those or pick the policies based on what they think is good. And it is them who are making the decisions, they are the active participants. Now, in Schumpeter's view, which is really just a, a kind of a reinterpretation, a kind of re-emphasis of the same thing, his idea is that, in reality, people are just sort of stagnant. In fact, he actually com he thinks of people as being a kind of a landscape, a political landscape, with, which has a different geography, which, of course, people have different interests, there are different classes, uh, groups, and all this kind of stuff. And... What really happens is there's a kind of political geography, and the active participants are really the politicians. Politicians come, and it is their political goal to create government. And when I say, or Schumpeter says, that they are the active participants, it means they are the ones who, based on the democracy, are making their decisions of what policies to support. Now, in his metaphor of the poli a literal political landscape where two armies are fighting, being two political parties, it's literally the case that, uh, well, not literally, but you know what I mean, it's the case that, you know, you might have, uh, in the same way that an army might occupy a hill or a valley or some strategic location, politicians do the same thing, and their goal is gaining a particular majority, gaining government um, in this democratic landscape. But the democratic landscape itself doesn't necessarily change. 
So in his view, one of the he uses the example of Gladstone at his time. I mean, you could think of someone else like you know Donald Trump or something like this, um, where for a more contemporary example. But you know, in a lot of times in politics, you have enormous electoral shifts or shifts in what policies politicians uh, are pursuing, not really because the public has changed its opinion, but because someone comes like Gladstone or Donald Trump and realize, ah, there's a tactical position which no one is exploiting. Maybe it's immigration or something like that. And he is going to go and fortify that and make his decisions based on what he thinks he can gain from it. Now, one implication of this kind of view that might, I guess, go against the idealisms of some people in democracy is the fact that for any rational party in a democratic society, it's not necessarily the case that that party is going to have one particular set of ideological stances that they're going to have constant over time. In fact, I mean, if you look at American politics, we actually sort of talked about this in the last episode uh, when we talked about Albion Seed, but there's a lot of sense in which the two parties in the United States, or this is true in other countries as well, often will make tactical decisions of what policies to support or not support. And over time, they might actually even switch places or uh, on particular issues or sometimes generally on their social outlook. So it's not necessarily the case that a rational party is going to be one that's going to be ideologically consistent. Now, this is very contrary to the classical assumptions of dem democracy. I mean, if you look at uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, who wrote, you know, Democracy in America, this, you're probably familiar with this book, you may have heard of it, maybe even only name dropped. But one of the, he has this kind of classic idealization of democracy. And he divides parties in a democratic society into what he calls grand parties or great parties and small parties. And these aren't actually descriptive, it's not actually about their size, but in his idea, grand parties, which are good, uh, that's why they're called grand, uh, are parties that are motivated by ideology. So in contemporary American politics, the Green Party or the Libertarian Party are grand parties, great parties, and to Tocqueville's definition, whereas a small party is one that just chooses whatever it supports at the whim of politics, whatever is most convenient. And in his definition, the Republican and Democratic parties in the United States would be small parties. So this is sort of interesting because, you know, the terms, of course, are the exact opposite of what you would think if you're thinking in terms of size. Now, de Tocqueville's editorial stance in calling them like this is, of course, to make the point that parties should be based on ideology. But what Schumpeter sort of makes clear here is that in the reality of politics, there are so many issues to make tactical decisions about that it's not necessarily the case that even a party, well, actually, let's make it even wider. Even a party that is motivated by merely ideology might, for tactical reasons, uh, shove aside one of its more controversial things that it supports in order to gain in all the other policies that it supports. So even if you have an ideological party that is tied to a particular worldview, it's still, in the reality of democratic po politics, it still has to make particular sacrifices to get the other things that it wants. Now, as a final note on this, Despite the fact that Schumpeter isn't going to believe in a public will, he does embrace the reality that while people's interests don't come together into one uniform will, it is the case that political decision-making has to be unified. And again, behind a government, government in the parliamentarian sense, I, I suppose I should say, a majority. And that is, once someone has successfully conquered the political landscape and becomes a majority, there is a necessity, or not just a necessity, it's just an inevitability that policy will be worked into one particular frame. That's to say that, uh, well, to put it this way, a lot of people who will have colder takes on democracy will often say something like, well, you know, the par problem with America, for example, is the two-party system. If only we had more parties, then you know, uh, politics would be more like how we liked it. Uh, now, if you compare American politics to Australian politics or British politics or other systems where there is a voting system that is not winner-take-all in one way or another in the uh, uh, Congress or whatever, or the Parliament, uh, you see that in reality this isn't necessarily the case because while you might have, let's say we implemented some kind of 
parliamentary uh, proportional representation in the American legislature. And that would mean that people could vote, if 10% of the people voted for the Libertarian Party, 10% of the representatives there in Congress would be Libertarian. Now, if this were the case, it might seem like there is more representation of Libertarian beliefs, but in a lot of ways, this isn't really the case. And the reason for that is, despite the fact that there might be more people in the actual legislature, there is still the reality that everything has to converge at a median of policy consensus within the legislature itself. So what you're doing, in effect, when you have a parliamentary system, you're really replacing, I mean, to put it in American terms, it would be like replacing some Democratic congressmen with Green congressmen and replacing some Republican congressmen with Libertarians or something else, or Constitution Party or something like that. And despite the fact that there would be more diversity in the legislature, uh, it would still have to converge on a majority, and especially in terms, if we're dealing in terms of a narrow right and left or something like that, it's the case that really electorally, if you have more extremists, it doesn't really matter because you'll have to get to that median point to actually decide what kind of policies to implement. And those are the only ones that are going to actually pass the legislature. So if you have hard five hardcore communists, on in your legislature, it's not going to make a big difference unless you give them some kind of particular power like uh, uh, filibustering or something like that. But in general, democracy is not necessarily changed by having a different representation of policy or uh, of parties. Schumpeter makes the point that the only thing that really matters is the ability to make government <clears throat> or to make majority. Great. So we've gone on for around an hour or so, and there's a whole lot of stuff to talk about with respect to democracy, but I think a lot of it we're going to have to leave to some other episode. I don't know if it's going to be directly on democracy. It might be sublimated in something else, but I hope this has given you sort of an introduction, not just to the specific books, but some of the ideas that are out there in public choice and other discourse on democracy. And before we go, I do want to talk about uh, back, back to Kaplan, or more generally, how, given the constraints of democracy, given the fact that people are rationally irrational, right? They cling to their biases and that causes political democratic uh, harm in some sense. Uh, given that, how can we provide, how can we either improve democracy or what is an alternative democracy? Because a lot of people nowadays, I might have said this before, but a lot of people nowadays have the idea that you either live in a democracy or you live in a totalitarian state. And that's not really the case. That's something we can go into in another video. In fact, Schumpeter, I didn't note it here, but Schumpeter uh, has nearly a whole chapter on the fact that democracy in a lot of ways is antithetical to personal freedom. Um, he talks about the persecution of minorities and stuff, which is really a, d a democratic a democratic thing. The aristocracy doesn't isn't necessarily interested in stuff like that. But I won't go into that too much. Read Schumpeter if you want it. But Kaplan, incidentally, sort of uh, talks uh, about the same thing, right? So... Now, Kaplan's ideal, I suppose you could say, is not necessarily the replacement of democracy with something else, maybe even something bad, but it's really just the scaling back of some aspects of democracy or politics away from certain parts of American life, or, well, whatever country you're living in life. Now, he says, well, I'll read a passage on page 192. He says, before 19, the 1930s, Many areas of U.S. economic life were undemocratically shielded from federal and state regulation. The market periodically trumped democracy on everything from the minimum wage to the natural, National Recovery Administration. And unless you're a democratic fundamentalist, you have to be open to the possibility that this was all for the good. Now, of course, he's referring to the fact that during the New Deal administration, New Deal administration, there was a tendency to further and further centralize economic decision making. And a lot of times, that meant the reduction or the regulation of individual people's land or property or stuff like this. So Kaplan, I think, makes a point. Again, he's, he comes from a libertarian perspective. So, you know, he has the idea that we don't necessarily need to replace democracy with something else. But if we just got a lot of people's economic and personal decision making out of the realm of government constitutionality, constitutionality, really, with, with respect to the Constitution, uh, we don't have to worry about whether democracy is bad or good. We can live in a society where, okay, maybe democracy doesn't produce the best results, but a lot of our life is shielded from it. 
Now, another option he throws out there, I don't, I don't know if he really supports this, but it, it's an idea that he throws out there, is the idea of double voting. So you might not have heard of this, but in the United Kingdom, he notes this is something they practiced even into the late 40s, where people who were had university degrees had the ability to vote in their local precinct, and their vote also counted doubly in the place where they got their, their degree from. So people, in effect, had double votes if they were highly educated. And one of the things that Kaplan notes when he goes into his comparison of uh, normal people and economists in terms of their opinions, he notes that there are a lot of demographic categories in the public which, for which uh, the decision-making becomes more characteristic of an informed economist. And he says, for example, people who have been in education longer are more likely to vote like an economist. Maybe we could give these people double votes, or maybe people who are older, etc., now, of course, there are other, there are other demographic groups that, uh, in his model, vote better as well. For example, men vote better than women, but he doesn't want to be a bad boy and suggest that men should do vote double. But uh, his whole point here is that instead of denying the suffrage to people, you could just throw some extra votes in, in targeted populations that tend to have more long, I was about to say long-winded, long-sighted uh, political economic views. Uh, but... That, again, is not necessarily what he wants. That's just a band-aid, he suggests, if we have to live in what he calls democratic fundamentalism. His goal is simply a repeal, a, an increase in personal freedom at the expense of democracy. Um, as, I, as we noted just a second ago, those are very different things, despite the fact that sometimes they get conflated. Now, maybe a more practical solution would just be a kind of decentralization of political decision-making. Now, remember that rational irrationality and rational ignorance happen when people do not have, don't pay for the direct consequences of what they vote for. Now, in a lot of respects, when we vote for someone in a federal election or a nationwide election, we have very little control of that. And that, I mean, re realistically speaking, for most affairs, who the president is, what's going on in Washington, D.C. doesn't really affect you that much day to day. And it might seem like something strange to say, but it, it's true in a lot of ways. In a lot of ways, what changes where you live, how you live, what you pay for what, all this kind of stuff is affected by your local government. Now, despite the fact that we don't really focus on that a lot, that is, there is a whole lot that happens at that local level. And of course, it affects the federal level, level as well. Now, one concept out there that uh, I, I, Kaplan might have mentioned it, but it's common among other critics of democracy uh, who don't want to replace it with totalitarian or so, totalitarianism or something like that, suggests what I guess you could call subsidiarity. And that's the idea that if some kind of political organization happens, it should happen at the lowest possible level ever. That is, if you... Uh, I mean, it's in the United States, of course, we have this idea of states' rights, but it actually goes further than that. That is, if you have a political issue, if you have some kind of social issue to de deal with, it should be dealt with at the closest level to you. Now, this isn't just a way of keeping your eggs in different baskets politically. It's not just a way of making sure that we are all are not on the same sinking ship. It also serves to put the consequences of your political behavior very close to where you actually live. That is, if you make a particular decision about uh, something financial or something with respect to immigration or something with respect to a social policy or zoning laws or any amount of political decision making, if you make those and they happen in your community and that's where your decisions affect them, that's something that you affects you great, very greatly and you are much more incentivized to educate yourself or be informed of the issues when you're making some kind of decision. So in a lot of ways, localizing decision making, even if you still have democracy, even if, even if you have a much more local democracy or local rule, this gets rid of a lot of the problems because it reduces rational irrationality. People might have their biases, but they're much easier to overcome when you have that sort of Damocles over you that your decisions in an election of, you know, a hundred or so people might affect you quite a great deal. And so you have every incentive to make the right choices. Now, of course, there are plenty of other band-aids for, solutions for, replacements for, and comments on democracy that we can talk about in another episode. We've only touched the surface here. We didn't even talk about Arrow's impossibility theorem. Can you believe it?
But I'm going to go ahead and draw this to a close. Now remember, as always, if you guys are still watching this on YouTube, don't you don't, you don't got to watch it on YouTube. Go to notrelated.xyz. There, there's going to be the RSS link to this podcast. Get it on the podcast. I see every week more and more and more people are using it on the podcast and less people are using it on YouTube. So I guess that's good. Even though theoretically I'm getting money in monetization on YouTube, but whatever. Use It's always best to use the actual podcast RSS. It's there. Everything is nice and tagged for you. I'm such a nice guy. If you have any questions about this episode, any suggestions for what you want to see, email me at luke at lukesmith.xyz. And you can email any donations with your comments, and I will read them out at paypal.me slash lukemsmith. That's M as in, ooh, running out of M words. Um, Metric, metric system. Okay, that'll be enough. All right, well, I'll see you guys next time. Oh, wait. Yeah, I should probably say what I'm... No, I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to do next time on. I actually haven't quite decided. I always like to make the decisions as late as possible. But there are two books in mind, and... uh, Well, I'm not going to tell you. You'll find out. See you next time.